<laughs> Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this evening. For this great time that we have together here. To open your word and to be nourished by it. In a very special way. And we ask your blessings upon us this evening as we glorify you by saying glory be to the Father and to the Son. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we are still in the Easter season and one of the striking elements of the Easter stories that we read about is Jesus after the resurrection, the very first thing that he does right after he resurrects from the dead is, and you might have missed it. That's why it's good that, you know, the Lord has me here because you might have missed this particular detail. It's in John chapter 20. Uh, you might have missed the fact that Jesus, right after the resurrection, the first thing he does is laundry yes you've heard it laundry and so let me read this to you uh, right from the beginning of uh, chapter 20 of the gospel of john on the first day of the week mary of magdala came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark and saw the stone removed from the tomb so she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths folded there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths folded there, and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. There you have it. Jesus did laundry. He folded his clothes. That's my interpretation of it. But the first time I've heard it uh, was in the seminary. One of our professors talked about uh, Jesus folding the burial cloths as we see here and arranging them neatly. And the way I see it is Jesus did laundry. And so I have this wonderful poem that speaks about the resurrection and Jesus doing laundry. And so listen to this wonderful poem. After Jesus climbed up out of death, the first thing he did was the laundry. He creased the shroud that covered his face just so and placed it back where it belonged. He could have left it in a messy pile in a hurry to file his taxes on time or make that lunch date to outrun death again with a long list of errands. But he took the time in the tomb to fold the laundry like he had eternity on his side. Maybe it was just that he dearly loved the marvel of fabric, the hands, earth, and magic that made it. The first thing he touched when the wind blew back his, into his beaten up lungs. One thing's for sure. No one ever thinks of the laundry as resurrection. But both never end. <laughs> And you know that from your own lives. The laundry never ends. Neither does the resurrection. When we talk about the resurrection, we are not just talking about this one event from the life of Jesus. 
that he rose from the dead one time. We are talking about a way of living, to live in the resurrection. Now, in the Roman Catholic Church, we have what we call the seven sacraments. These are the official seven ways that God communicates His grace to us. When we say the word grace, and you know that word, because there's a very famous song called Amazing Grace. We hear that song all the time. The word grace is referring to God's help, God's gift. When God communicates His grace to us and imparts His grace to us, we receive some of His life into us. And so we have seven official sacraments of the church. And the definition of a sacrament is a visible sign of an invisible reality. So in the sacrament, for example, of the Eucharist, the visible sign is the bread and wine, but the invisible reality is the grace that you are receiving through the reception of the body and blood of Jesus. Now, everyday life, there are different ways that God communicates His life to us, that God imparts in us His grace. We just miss them. We miss them. Like, Right here, Jesus cooks and does laundry after the resurrection. This is by far one of the most striking elements of the post-resurrection stories that we find in John's Gospel. The first thing Jesus does is fold the laundry. Wow! And the last thing Jesus does on earth is He cooks a meal for His friends. Now, Jesus was on a tire, tireless, tireless, tire, tireless, tireless. English is a tough language. Jesus was on a tireless three-year mission. Yes, I said three years. You said, okay, well, he, he was alive for 33 years. Jesus was 33 when he died. But he only worked in public for three years. He was on a, only on a mission for three years. So you might have missed this, but 30 years out of his 33 years, he spent living a private life with his family and only three years in public life. And so, during these three years of his frantic public ministry, working miracles, he preaching, and then, here, then there was this final week of his earthly life in Jerusalem. You know what that was like. Uh, there's this urgent, immediate, and breathless feeling in that week. And then Jesus dies, and he lies in a quiet tomb, and then the resurrection. And one thing we might miss as we are celebrating and rejoicing in this Easter season, and we might overlook, is that after such a wild pace of Holy Week, filled with so many shocking and heartbreaking events, the resurrection by comparison is downright sedate. It's a calm experience. Jesus cooks and does laundry. Now, ask yourself this question. Are we to live in Holy Week? Or are we to live in the resurrection? We are to be people of the resurrection, are we not? Not people of Holy Week. Hence, we are to live calm lives peace-filled lives, not hurried lives. <clears throat> Jesus is no longer doing miracles for the masses after the resurrection. He's no longer confronting the powers that be. He's no longer teaching in synagogues, no longer leading a movement. In the resurrection, all we find is these few simple things. Slowly, everything is slow, gardening, walking, eating, laundry, and cooking. 
So ask yourself this question. How do you live your life? Do you live your life in Holy Week? Always running, everything fast-paced, never having time for anything? Or do you live your life as a person of the resurrection? If you're too busy, that means you are too busy. Get rid of some things. Your kids don't need to be in a gazillion sports. One sport, not every single one that ever existed. One, one sport, it's enough. Your kids don't need all of these lessons that you've signed them up for. Because you think they're the smartest ones ever, you know, and they just need to be even smarter. They have to have piano lessons and, and uh, violin lessons, all these lessons. One! They don't need all those lessons. Your children need you. You don't have to be a part of every committee and every organization that ever existed or was founded. Some of you, now that you've retired, you're busier now than you've ever have been because you've signed up for all these clubs. You're always running, always. Every minute that passes by is a minute you will never get back. Every day that passes by is a day you will never get back. What can be done today can also be done tomorrow, can it not? Enjoy life, in other words. Enjoy that which is the most important in your life, and that is first God, and then the people in your life. Enjoy the people in your life. In other words, eat, drink, and be merry. Your children will never be 11 again. And so, you know, most of the time now that they're 11, you know, you're spending in the car because you're driving them from one place to the next. You have no time. They will never be 15 again or 5 again. Your wife will never be 45 again. Mm -hmm. Enjoy her now while she's 45, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Before the world set in, okay? <laughs> it's like, you know, the people who have money and have all this vacation time, but they're, and they're, you know, they're, they're 60 some years old, and they have the money and they have the vacation time, but they won't go on the vacation because they have all this work to do. When you're 80, you won't be able to enjoy it as much because everything's gonna ache. Your knees won't work as well, okay? To go down the cobblestones in, in Europe where you've always wanted to go. So do it. You don't even know if you're gonna wake up tomorrow. And you're so worried. The Bible makes it very clear. The Bible says, why worry about tomorrow? Today has enough problems of its own. You have to live today. Because you don't even know if tomorrow will come. For many, it won't come. You have one chance to live this life. One chance. We don't believe in the reincarnation. You don't get to come back, okay? Not even as a rat, okay? Okay? <laughs> you don't get to do it over again. So make the best of it. You gotta have priorities in this life. You have to prioritize. How many stomachs do you have? Some people act as if, you know, as if they have more than one stomach. We're not cows, we just have one stomach, okay? You can only eat so much, so why do you want more and more and more? The more, the Bible says, the more a person has, the more they will want. You never be satisfied until you learn to be satisfied with what you have. So, your job is to become holy. Oh yes, you've heard that before? Yes, holy. 
That's our job in this life, to become holy. Not successful, not rich, not famous. Holy. So you, what does that mean? You don't need to work overtime or live in a big house or have a fancy car. What you need is God and family and people in your life. For with God and with people comes the real fuel we all need for living. And that fuel is love. The Bible says God is love. That's our real fuel for, for living. So the laundry, the laundry. The first thing Jesus does is fold up the laundry. I mean, who does that? It's enough to make my whole heart warm with his presence like a load of white straight from the dryer. Then he cooks a meal. You know, in all of the Bible, in all the, all, all the four gospel accounts, Jesus enjoys a lot of meals, but he never cooks a meal until after the resurrection. Meals feature so heavily throughout the Gospels, and yet Jesus apparently never took the time to cook one himself until after he resurrected. The last thing he does for his loved ones. You know, there's nothing more special to me as a priest than people who take their time to cook a meal and have me over to their home. Okay? Restaurants do not impress me. The fact that you can dish out a couple hundred dollars and pay for a meal is not as impressive as if you would spend hours making that meal and laboring over it. Okay, no matter how horrible that meal may be. <laughs> and I have been subjected to some really interesting ones. <laughs> Father, would you like seconds? Oh no, thank you. <laughs> That's one of the job hazards of being a priest, okay? Why I many times would be a lot better to go to a restaurant. There's something about, you know, the fact that somebody spent the time to do it that says, what? Love. It's touching. It's loving. For example, someone who brings me a trail mix that they have worked on themselves, you know, putting so much uh, cranberries in there that they have, they're full of antioxidants, putting so much almonds, putting so much walnuts, okay, in, in there, and taking the time to actually put it together. That's a lot more impressive than somebody who goes and buys me a box of granola bars at Costco and says, here, <laughs> you know. You, are, you, are you getting the, what I'm saying here? In the resurrection, it seems to me that Jesus institutes the sacrament of housework and everyday chores. And you who thought, you know, what you did as a mother, what you do as a father, what you do as a husband or a wife is not blessed. You become holy in the context of a family. That's how Jesus became holy. In fact, the church teaches us that our family is what we call the domestic church. The domestic church is our family. You know, and if there only had been lawns to cut in first century Palestine, pools to, pools to clean, a lot of you have pools here in Las Vegas, that's why I put this one in here, because you have to do that a lot. So your kids can swim in a clean pool, okay? Homework to help them with driving your kids to the soccer game, gutters to clean, dishes to do, dishes. Homes to vacuum and dust, shopping to do, bills to pay. In other words, the ordinary mundane things, stuff of everyday life. Jesus would have had done them all. He would have had to do them all, and he would do it with great love. You see, you're not called to do great things in your life, okay? Build the Taj Mahal, no, okay? You're called to do the small, little, everyday things, but do them with great love and dedication. 
such as making a trail mix instead of going and buying the granola bars, okay? Fixing a meal for your family instead of going through the drive through at McDonald's. In other words, slow down. Why are you in such a hurry? Slow down. It's almost as if Jesus is asking us to pay attention to the slow and the ordinary as the place where we are most likely to find resurrection, the sacrament, the grace being poured into our hearts, not in the hectic busyness of trying to change and transform the world or our churches or our lives. Just go about your life. Stop trying to change all the people around you. Just do your part with great love. Or maybe he's trying to tell us that if we want to change the world or even ourselves, we should cook a meal or do the laundry. Because if that can't lead us to Jesus, if your call as a wife or a mother or a friend or a husband, if your call, your everyday life doesn't lead you to Jesus, in other words, to love, to transformation, well, then nothing probably will. Nothing. And that leads me to what I want to talk to you about today in this year of mercy. We are in the year of mercy right now, as the Pope tells us. And the year of mercy is calling us to take in the mercy of God, how much God showers me with mercy. And mercy is what? Mercy is kindness. That's another way to say mercy. Kindness, compassion, understanding. God showers me with that. God showers me with unconditional forgiveness that anything and everything I may have done in my life, God forgives me for because of his great love for me. God showers me with that. And God then wants me to be his agent in the world, an agent of mercy. I'm forgiven and I'm called to forgive. And we have looked at one story already of mercy in the Bible, the story of the prodigal son. But I want to look at another very famous one today with all of you. And that is one that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. And that's the story of the Good Samaritan. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Good Samaritan. Of course you have. Of course you have. I know you have. I know it. And the story of the Good Samaritan is in chapter uh, 10 of the Gospel of Luke. And... Please listen. And I want to start a little earlier than the story of, of, um, of the Good Samaritan because we'll talk about um, the great, greatest commandment, verse 25. There was a scholar of the law who stood up to test Jesus and said to him, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Listen to that question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He said in reply, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor... As yourself he replied to Jesus Jesus replied to him you have answered correctly do this and you will live But because he wished to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man fell victim to robbers as he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. They stripped 
and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road, but when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. Likewise, a Levite came to the place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at his sight. He approached the victim poured oil and wine over his wounds and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an inn and cared for him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction, Take care of him. If you spend more than I have given you, I shall repay you on my way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim? Jesus answered, the man answered, the one who treated him with mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Now, I don't think there is a more touching or more famous story in all of sacred scripture, isn't it, of, of mercy. This is such a heartwarming story. It's so tender. It says that we are all called to help the stranger in our midst. All of us are called to be agents of mercy. We're called to help God in the healing of the world. But this story is very misunderstood. It's often told as a self-congratulatory story about people like us, Christians, who think we know the right answer. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who was robbed? Answer, the one who showed him mercy. And we think we have gotten this answer so well that we embrace the Good Samaritan. And we, as we call him, as if he was one of us, you know, we name hospitals after him, charitable organizations after him. We think he was one of us, we have embraced him, and yet we forget that he was the enemy. He was the foe, the adversary. He was a Samaritan. He belonged to the other side. Now, shortly before Jesus tells this story of the Good Samaritan, uh, Luke tells us that Jesus' disciples have gone to a village, a Samaritan village, and they have been refused lodging. They are refused hospitality. And they come back to Jesus and they inform him of what happened. And they tell him, Jesus, we have to keep walking because the Samaritans have refused to give us lodging in their village. And they tell him, call down fire from heaven, they ask Jesus. And they say, burn this village down. Burn it down. Why? Because Jews in first century Palestine did not like Samaritans any better than Samaritans like Jews. They were bitter enemies. They hated each other. And you know, they had so much in common, so much in common with each other. But they disagreed about who was right about God. They both followed the Torah, though not the same version. They worshipped in a temple, though not the same one. They both claimed to be God's chosen people, but neither one of them would admit that God maybe had more than one chosen people. They had a hard time. Each group viewed the other as a bunch of unclean people in the sight of God. A Samaritan did not want a Jew sleeping in his bed any more than a Jew would want a Samaritan to sleep in his bed. So, it's unlikely that Jesus was surprised by the disciples' anger. But then Jesus wants to tell us the same thing he told them. And that is, get over yourself. That's not how you deal with rejection. That's not how you deal with when people hurt you, when they reject you, when they betray you, when they turn you away. 
You don't do that. That's why Jesus teaches us what? When people hit you on one cheek, then when they strike you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. That's Christianity. You are to love your enemies. You are to be different. You are to pray for those who persecute you. If you love those, Jesus says, who love you, what's so different about you? Even the pagans do that. You're my followers. And you are to be known by your love. And love is mercy. Love is kindness. So, the way Jesus dealt with this scenario is by inventing a story and, and turning the Samaritan, this enemy, into a hero. A neighbor. The one who shows mercy. So he reverses the circumstances on the disciples, doesn't he? He puts, this, he, he puts, puts the Samaritan in the Jewish territory where it might have been hard for him to find a bed for the night. And he made the Samaritan the good guy, the foreigner who saved the life of a man whose own people let him down. Didn't you see that? The priest passes him by, the Levite passes him by, and the Samaritan is the one who comes to his rescue, to his aid, to help him. So, maybe it's wishful thinking on Jesus' part, or maybe he wants to remind all of us, his followers, we call ourselves his followers, that you never really know what's inside of a person. You think you know, but you never know. You don't know what's inside of a person. As much as you think you may know. And based on our prejudiceness, because of our history as people, we have been imbued with all sorts of prejudices to look at people and to judge them and to think we already know them because of where they come from, what they look like, who they are or who we think they are. But you don't know. You never really know. And people are capable of surprising us every day. That's why Jesus says, judge not, lest ye be judged. Don't judge another person. A single act of kindness, in other words, has the power to call a whole history of againstness into question. So, by doing this, what did Jesus do to the disciples as he wants to do to all of us tonight? He's putting the word good because the Bible here calls this story the story of the Good Samaritan. And who was this written for? For first century Jews who when they heard the word Samaritan, they probably heard what? ISIS! Like you might be hearing today. Muslims, terrorists, should I go on and, you know, whatever. So Jesus is putting the word good and Samaritan in his hearer's mind and hopefully in their hearts so that when they hear the word Samaritan, they have good with it. Oh, it's revolutionary, isn't it? You see how powerful this story is if you really take in what Jesus is trying to say here? For the first time in, his, in their lives, Jesus is putting the word good and Samaritan into their minds. Because why? Because Jesus knows that sometimes you have to begin to tell a different kind of story before a different kind of future can unfold. Look at it this way. If Jesus had been a Samaritan, he would have told probably a parable of the good Jew. But since Jesus is a Jew, he tells the story of the good Samaritan. So imagine the hero here in this story and the, is the last person in the world you would want to call good or the last person in the world you would want to give you CPR. And now you have to put that in your mind. Good and them. For example, your mother-in-law. Good mother-in-law. Okay? Your ex-husband or ex-wife. Good so-and-so. That's hard to do, isn't it? Okay? 
or in today's climate. See, I'm translating this for you for today. Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. Okay? Good. You get it? Okay. Or here, we're getting, let's get serious right here. Okay? L listen to this. The person who raped you or who abused you or who hurt you. In other words, we're talking here about mercy. Good and them in there. And that's difficult, isn't it? And you, who, and you thought that you were such a finished product, that you didn't have anything to work on. Mm. Mm -hmm. Or the person who is making your life at work impossible. Okay? Let's whatever, you know, her name is or his name is, okay? Good. Or the person who gossips about you and make things, makes things up about you. Good and them in the same line. Now you see how this Christianity business is getting tough, isn't it? And you thought it was so easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our problem is, is that, you know, it's easy to just show up on Sunday, you know, and do your 45 minutes and leave right after communion, you know, because you've got your communion already, so, you know, why wait for the blessing? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's great. We just, we don't want to do the real work here, do we? We don't want to change. I didn't come here to play no games with all of you, okay? I came here to be real. I've got stuff to work on, and you've got stuff to work on. So let's get going. Because we want to go to heaven, do we not? I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to purgatory. I'm going to heaven. That's where I want to go. You want to go to purgatory? I'm, I want to go to heaven because I want to be with God. That's why I'm continually looking to change. And we all got to remove things from our lives. The scales that are blinding us. Or a Democrat, if you're a Republican, put the word good and Democrat. Or good Republican, if you are a Democrat. Or someone from a different religion who hates you. Or as I've told you, a member of ISIS. You've got to remove your, your ideas about people. Think of the Middle East today, for example. Since this is where this story took place. Make the man in the ditch an Israeli Jew. And after a rabbi and a member of the Israeli Knesset have passed him by, imagine a Muslim member of Hamas bending to bind the man's wounds and bathe him and making sure he is taken care of by paying for a room in a hotel. If this scenario could be imagined in the Middle East today by the people living there, perhaps we might have a chance for peace. You know, one of the greatest things that has happened to me as a, during my six years as a priest, and I'm coming upon my six years this month, and I'm so grateful to the Lord, but it was, I took a trip uh, in my last parish with a, a choir. It was the North Coast Chorale, and we went uh, to Europe, in this choir, this community choir, and I accompanied them. And first we went to Poland. And they had a sister choir in Malsch, Germany. Malsch, Germany, which is right on the French border, uh, near, um, not too far from Frankfurt, in Germany. And I grew up hearing about how terrible the Germans were. In fact, when you say the word in Polish, Niemiec, that was synonymous with something evil. One of the worst things you could call somebody would be calling them a German, you know. If you call, that's like calling somebody something really bad. 
I grew up in that in my head. That was ingrained in me from the time I was small. And here the, this choir was telling me that we were going to go to the town and I had agreed to that. And not only that, we were going, because they are sister choir, we were going to be welcomed into the homes of these German people and I was going to have to sleep in their home mm -hmm, and eat with them. I had this, you know, I, I was told all these things, you know, that they're very cold people, you know, they, they're this, they're that, you know, they're n nobody you ever would want to be around. And there when we arrived, they were then, they were just like me and you. They were just like us. We shared around, you know, one of the great things is uh, when I did the opening prayer there, they asked me to do the opening prayer. And uh, of course, everybody had a beer. A big beer. It was very good. And one of the first things I did is I raised it and I said, Nazdrowie! And all the Germans, that's Polish, you know, they all went, Nazdrowie! The whole history of againstness that was imbued in me melted away because of sitting down, enjoying a meal, having a beer, laughing, and realizing that they are as much people as me. How our world would change if we'd only learn to do that. So I don't know where this story needs to change for you. You know, the, the people who have hurt you in your life are people just like you. And if they knew what they had done to you, they wouldn't have done it. If they knew what they were doing to you, they would have never done it. The people in your life love you the way they know how. They love you the way they know how. That's what we have to learn in this life. All of us are very hurt individuals. All of us. Needy, hurt individuals. Because of this life, this journey. If you realize that about the people who have done things to you, it will be easier for you than to shower them with mercy and acceptance and understanding. <coughs> I, one of the hardest things uh, for me to do, and I did this this past weekend, and I do this very often with all of you because, uh, you know, I share myself with all of you in the hope that um, it will bring the gospel more alive. But not only that, because I love all of you very much. I really do. I hope that you feel that. Uh, and, you know, you call me father. And I think to myself, I figure, you know, uh, if we are to be a family and I'm to be father, then how can we love one another if you don't know the father? So that's why I share myself with all of you. And one of the hardest things for me in, during my life that has happened to me was after my parents divorced, um, uh, my mom brought the man that uh, she eventually married, my stepfather, to live with me and her because I moved in with her. My, my brother moved in with, uh, with my father, but I lived with my mom. And he moved in with us, and I was 14 years old at the time. And if you know anything about 14-year-olds, it's a very tough age. And so I was very rebellious. There was a lot of stuff that happened. You know, things were said, horrible things were said. I was not very kind to him, because I, I thought he was coming in to break up my family. I wanted my family back. You know, I wanted my parents to be back together. I wanted for me and my brother to live again together. You know, I wanted us to be together. I didn't want this. And so I took it out on him. And I recognized that. You know, and I, I feel very bad about that. And I've apologized to him over and over again for my behavior. Um, but 
during that time, the tension was so big that he told my mother, he says, you know, um, it's either him, meaning me, or I, he says. You know, one of us has to go. We can't live here together. And so my mom came to me and she said, you're going to have to move in with your father. So can you imagine the, the pain and the rejection and the betrayal? You're going to have to go live with your father. And um, so I did move in with my father and, uh, and I had these immense feelings of uh, resentment toward her for a very long time. And I was in the seminary and I said, Lord, you know, I, I have these negative feelings. Uh, how can I be a priest and, and lead people and to forgiveness and tell them to forgive and tell them to love unconditionally and to show mercy when I have this in me? Help me. And I would pray for that over and over again. And then I went to counseling, which I have recommended for all of you so many times. The, and through counseling and through the power of God, because you can't do this on your own, you know. Any, any type of problems that we face, we can't get through them on our own. We need the help of the Almighty to help us. There came a, a point through God's grace, which is that special gift of God, that I realized that my mother loved me the way she knew how to love me. She offered me what she knew how to offer me from her own life experience. In other words, the people in our life who have hurt us, as Jesus says from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Whoever's hurt you in your life, if they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't have done it. You have to pray for the strength to be moved to great compassion and understanding and mercy towards them. For they know not what they do. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like yours unto thine. You know, give me that humility and meekness that you have so that I may forgive as you forgive and doesn't that bother you from the cross that Jesus says, Father, forgive them? After all they did to him, he's able to say that. We're called to imitate him in our life and to do the same thing. So I don't know where this Good Samaritan story has to happen for you in your life. Like, I don't know. The good news is only good once you have given up your idea of who is good and who is not. And the quickest way for this to happen to us is to get robbed, is it not? So as to have the perspective of the ditch. Because from the pers this perspective, anyone who helps you, and I mean anyone, is your best friend or your neighbor. I went down to the ditch so as to then be lifted up by God's grace. God allowed this. I've told you this before. God allows everything and anything in our life for our own good, as much as we don't know why. But God permits it. God allowed me to have that experience of the ditch so that I can come to have the heart that I have today. I would not have the heart that I have today if it wasn't for all those experiences some of which I have shared with you, and one of which I just shared with you. I wouldn't have the heart that I have today if it wasn't for that. See, God is not after making life easy for us. God is after developing us. God wants to develop you. That's why he permits all those ditch experiences to humble us. To allow us to become better people, more merciful people. 
But this requires for you to give up some of, of all that you have held on to. And to realize that you really know very little. The only thing you know is you know nothing. So who is your neighbor? Not the one who looks like you, talks like you, thinks like you, or worships like you. The one who shows you mercy, that's your neighbor. That's your neighbor. Did you notice here, does Jesus care what the Samaritan believes? No, it's what he does that matters, doesn't it? It's the Samaritan's actions that count. So he reads a different scripture, goes to a different temple, he follows a different path. So what? Jesus is focused on the man's actions, not his beliefs. Now this is upsetting to all of us Christians who have been so focused on the fact that it's by faith that everything is done. But we are Catholics, are we not? It's not through just faith. Faith and works, as the Bible tells us in the book of James. You want to talk about faith? All the faith that you have, the Bible says, I'll show you my works and they will testify to my faith. So there you have it. Jesus, the one who shows us the way. Now, this is sad news for all of you who may think that going to church or, you know, any church is okay. What does it matter? It does matter. There are real differences in our approach. That's why it's so important that you know your Catholic faith. If you knew your Catholic faith, really knew it, you would never give it up because it's so rich and powerful and it's liberating. So learn your Catholic faith and live it. And one of the timeless teachings of the church is that right belief does nothing. It does you no good to believe the right things because it does not put a cup of water in the hand of a thirsty person. Right belief does not put a cup of water in the hand of a, hand, in the hand of a thirsty person or bandage a wound. Right beliefs don't change a thing unless they lead us to actions. Actions. I may believe about being a forgiving person, but unless I practice it, it doesn't mean anything. I may believe in mercy, but unless I shower the people around me with mercy, it don't do anything. Even the lawyer knows that here. Even he knows that. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, in our country, the great question that is po po posed to all of us all the time, what must I do to be saved? And it's a very good question, isn't it? Just because you know the right answer doesn't mean you have taken it for a test drive. Je that's why Jesus says to the lawyer, you have given the right answer. And then he tells him what? Do this. Do this. And you will live. Jesus doesn't say, believe this. Confess with your lips. He doesn't say that. He says, do it. That's why we have to do it. It's not what the Samaritan believes, but it's what he does. So, I need you to all make a great examination of conscience. We hear that word in the church all the time, examining our conscience. As a priest, I have to do this every single day before I go to sleep. I have to examine my conscience. Look at all those things in me every single day that are not good, that are not allowing me to follow the Lord Jesus as he wants me to. So for example, you believe in being generous. All of you believe in being generous. And yet you have amassed this great wealth and you don't share it. Mm -hmm. You believe in being generous and you surely can afford a memorial candle. <laughs> You knew that one was coming, didn't you? <laughs> I couldn't help myself. <laughs> so
So you believe in loving your country. You believe in loving your country. And yet, you say, you know, I love my country. And yet, you believe that and you say, I believe it. I love my country. It's part of me. And yet, you don't vote. Do you really love your country? You believe in good health, and yet you don't exercise and eat right. But I believe in good health. What does it do for you? The fact that you believe it, what has it done for you? You got diabetes. Where, where's your actions? You believe in putting your kids first and your family first, and yet you put your work first. But you believe that, you, you say that, I would venture to say all of us, you know, I mean most, I, never, I haven't talked to a, a person that believes in putting their work first. It's always, you know, my family's first, and yet I work 14 hours a day. How many plates of food can you eat? You know? I, I have, I've been all over the world in, in places where people live, you know, whole families live in two rooms or one room, you know. And yet you, you really need this huge house to run around in, and that's why you need all of, I mean, what do you do, chase yourself around there? I mean, it's, it's like, you know. You say you believe in the power of counseling, yet you are unwilling to get any of your issues straightened out. But you say, oh, it's okay for others to do it. It's great. But yet you won't do it. Yeah, now I'm hitting a nerve. I can see that. Mm -hmm. So you believe in the power of prayer, and yet you don't pray every day. You know? You believe that stealing is wrong, and yet you waste food. You throw it out. You know what Pope Francis said, wasting food is stealing from the poor. That doesn't mean, you know, you overeat, but you can... What you have on your plate, you can also eat it tomorrow, too. We have refrigerators in this country, you know. You don't have to finish it. You could eat it tomorrow. See? Now I've really hit a nerve. Because we're all guilty of that, are we not? How much food we waste, even when we have our own functions here at St. Joseph, husband of Mary. It's amazing. Go buy the garbage can. It's unbelievable. You know? We believe in the power of the Bible, and yet, you know, so you, you say, I believe in the power of the Bible, yet you don't read it. Now I'm really hitting a nerve. We believe in the power of the Mass. Oh, it's absolutely the best thing ever. And yet, you know, I just go once a week. Well, I really could go more than once a week if I really put my mind to it. See, right answers aren't worth the breath it takes to say them unless they take on flesh at some point, leading the person who knows them to live the right kind of life. Just because you know the right things don't mean a thing. You've got to put it into action. So, for example, you know, I went to school for a very long time. For a very long time. So that I could learn all the right answers and then I could become known for knowing the right answers. Okay? That was supposed to be real funny. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> you know? And I learned the Bible in Hebrew and Greek, how to read it in Hebrew and Greek. I learned how to tell the difference between the early letters of Paul and the later letters of Paul. I learned how to explain the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the dual nature of Christ, the hypostatic union, okay, and all that. Uh, I learned how to uh, attempt to 
explain you know how the three persons of the holy trinity work and all that so i, I how they relate to one another i learned all those things and sometimes i would go down to the basement of the uh, seminary library and i would study there for hours and i would be getting drunks on the fume i would be getting drunk on the fumes of the highlighter because i would highlight away you know because <laughs> i was so into what i was uh, studying and then whatever i was studying all of a sudden uh, there would be this moment of grace you know how that is in your own life where i would get it all of a sudden and i would then go at the top of my lungs and i would yell inside of me of, of about whatever it is that i got i finally got it i get this thing i was so excited i get it i get it i finally get it and then I would close my books and I would go upstairs and I would expect everything to be different because of my newly found enlightenment that I found in the library. And yet my classmates looked as stressed as ever. My enlightenment did nothing for them. Okay? They were as depressed about the food we had to eat as, as ever. In other words, this is what Jesus says here. You have given the right answers. Do this. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. Do it and you will live. You know, it was not until this person who got robbed in this particular story is lying in a clean bed with his bill paid that he had time to reverse the answer that he had in his head about who was good and who was bad a Samaritan who would have thought a Samaritan you see how we have to continually allow our life to update our beliefs we have to allow life to teach us about our beliefs because you know I think that if you had asked the man in the ditch about who he believed would help him the clergyman the priest or the deacon or the bishop or the church people you know if you had asked him who would help him he would have gotten the answer all wrong wouldn't he because his beliefs were different he wouldn't have given the right answer he would have given the wrong answer it was not until later that his experience updates his beliefs a samaritan so we have to go out and change the world through our mercy one ditch at a time all of us and i don't know how you're all going to pull this off in las vegas but i'm sure you'll find a way okay i'm sure you'll figure this out because given the choice given the choice to pass the chance to love by and or do something the choice is clear do love kindness compassion understanding do that toward all those you meet even those who are unkind uncompassionate who don't understand you who may hate you who may wish you evil do love to all and you will live in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit Lord, we thank you for this great time together as we have opened your word and allowed that word to penetrate our hearts and to fill us with great peace. We ask you to come upon us with the gift of your Holy Spirit this evening so that we may better serve you, become better at serving you, so we may look into our lives and see all those things that need to be removed all that's blinding us 
all those sins that allow us to miss the mark of becoming holy people. And as you are developing us, we know that you are developing us for our own good. And so all that we have heard tonight, we take in and we pray, glorifying you always. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And did you notice that yes, in yesterday's Gospel, Jesus, when he came back, he raised his hand over the people to bless them. That's my greatest privilege is always to raise my hand over all of you and to bless you. As Jesus loves you, I hope that you know that I love you very much as well. And I thank you for being here this evening. And it really, it pains me to have to tell you that next week we...